this. Okay, let's move on here. Now we're getting into the text. Okay, now we're getting into the text here. So introductory issues. And the first thing we want to do is we want to identify covenant lexically. We're going to look at Hebrew, Greek, and English. So first, the 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 source for the word is found in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, and that word is berith. Berith, and this is not a an advanced level class, so we're not going to really discuss the Hebrew or the Greek, the reasons behind that. There is one, I, there might be one thing I might share. Hebrew word is berith. This occurs roughly 290 times in the Old Testament, which is actually quite a lot. If you're looking at all the different words used in the Old Testament, 290 times, that's like the top 25. So top 25 words in the Old Testament is very so this is not a isolated word that's rarely used this is a fundamental word so coming back to you know the dispensational new covenant covenant debates um people will say oh well dispensation is used in king james you know somewhere and it's like covenants used over 290 times just in hebrew okay so this is not a uh an isolated this is a heavily used uh word in the old testament and you're going to see soon how pervasive it is throughout scripture and so i just have several the initials are just referring if ever someone were to watch you know these are not my definitions they're coming from lexicons hebrew lexicons or dictionaries so the bdb is just initials they're also in the abbreviations page if you want to look at that it, it don't worry about it. it doesn't really mean anything to you except that that's the source where we're getting the information from so bdb which is a standard says that the word berith means covenant as a divine constitution or ordinance with signs and pledges. Very malakas, very strong, okay? Halit, halit is, again, another standard in, in Hebrew and Aramaic. They define berith as covenant agreement constitution or contract. So clearly here we're getting to using the synonyms a little bit more what it means, to define covenant at the same time covenant is unique so we don't want to just substitute oh it's an agreement that's it there's a lot more to it than that but we could we could at the most fundamental form call it an agreement and we'll see that's the case in the covenant of redemption people like people say oh i don't like the word covenant okay fine use agreement uh we're looking at the substance of the word not the word itself what what it actually means dictionary of classic classical hebrew so this is beyond this extends beyond the scripture they define it as covenant agreement or obligation. So again, it's also helping us to further understand what this word is. Most important for this class, though, is this is the original. This is the original foundation and context for the word. Okay, so this is the original context and foundation for the word. So then, when we look at the Greek in the New Testament, or we look at English, our understanding of covenant comes from the Scripture, but ultimately it comes from the Old Testament. That's going to be important. Because then as we look at the Greek word, the Greek word is diatheke, diatheke. This also means covenant or to make a covenant. This occur, this word occurs 30 times in the New Testament as a noun and six times in the New Testament as a verb. Okay, so not as much as berith in the Old Testament, but still quite a few times. This is, this is the big takeaway here, and I want us to focus here is that when you go to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, so the Greek translation is go going from Hebrew to Greek, okay? So the Septuagint was translated two centuries plus after the, the Old Testament was completed. What's important for us to note is that this occurred 324 times in the LXX. So this is the Greek translation of of the Old Testament. So it's not inspired, but it is very beneficial for us. Okay. And this is why in it, it is almost exclusively the Greek word that is translated in place of berith. And the importance for us is that there is, there is a gray area when it comes to diatheke, because there is another Greek word for covenant uh, synthike, we don't want to go into those definitions, but pe people will talk about it being more of a testament, not a covenant. And, and, and the big point is if you, if you go into reading on covenant theology in, in lexicons and um, theological dictionaries, they might try to, to, to change this word to mean 
to focus on testament. And there might be one or two times where you could do that, but for the most part, that's incorrect. Because of this, we we have to retain what what the word berith fundamentally means. Is everyone tracking there with me? Just to be clear, berith is translated into diatheke. So diatheke essentially needs to mean covenant. Okay, you're going to see in a second why this is important, okay? The Brill Ancient Greek, they define it as disposition, state, testamentary disposition. So there you go. We have testamentary and testament, but then you also have pact, accord, or agreement, okay? But the, the importance for us is that we should not be choosing this word testament, okay? A testament is very different than a covenant. We're going to see that in a second, right? A testament is just a last will or testament. It's just my wishes for you. You're just a benefactor, right? Um, but it's much more than that. Be de- so there you go. You have, it could be last will and testament, covenant, or compact, okay? And so what I'm arguing for is that when we look, go to the, when we go to the New Testament, fundamentally, we need to be highlighting this word. The, the Luanida dictionary says to make a solemn agreement involving reciprocal benefits and responsibilities to make a covenant, to covenant it together, making a covenant, covenant pact. So this is really, this is really good here. I didn't want to say this, but yeah. So, so the other, the, the, the word is synthike. So this is, so, so these two are close. This one is used more in, in equal agreements, equal covenants. And then of course, this one is more in testaments. It's unilateral. So this is unilateral. Okay. And so most, uh, most probably when I say unilateral, it means one way, right? So if, if I die and I have a testament, it's one way. My, my child gets everything, right? There's no agreement there. I make, I, I make an oath. I make an agreement. The testament stands in law. It's just unilateral, okay? Synthike would be where two people come together and they, have a, they make an agreement. They make a covenant, okay? So most probably why the, the Hebrew translators from Hebrew to Greek used diatheke and not synthike was that the synthike fundamentally meant equal, equal parties, and God is not equal with man. <laughs> so, so they were like, oh, we can't use synthike. The only other option is, is diatheke. And so that's why they use diatheke, because they want to emphasize the sovereignty of God. But it's deficient. It's just like there's words in Tagalog that are not one-to-one with English. And in English, there are words that are not one-to-one in Tagalog. And so you, you almost sometimes you have to explain. And so this would be a case from Hebrew to Greek. Where, where there wasn't a one-to-one word in Greek, the two words, the two options were deficient. This is actually the case with faith. Even faith in English, the Greek, the Greek word pistuo, which is like believe, faith, it's one word that has this comprehensive belief, trust, faith. We have like three words we use in English. And I think there's like four words in Tagalog. Diva, there's maniniwala, like, like right? Sumam sumam palataya something like that. There's a lot of different words, right? There's no one word in Tagalog that that conveys the the Greek word for pistuo, and that's the case here with berith. There's no one word in Greek, so they chose a deficient word, and so as as holding to the Hebrew scriptures, we would say the Hebrew scriptures give the meaning of the Greek word. And then the benefit that is that when you come to the New Testament, you shouldn't be using Testament. You should be using covenant. <laughs> so that's the big takeaway. So uh, buy it in the Philippines, the book. If not, I'll have to get with Enting and maybe Henry, how we can get copies to you guys. This book is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal book. I, it's top. It's top. Uh, Mel is asking for resources. This is like, of all the resources, this is this is the one. This is the one. So um but so, so what, what Myers says is that in, in the Vulgate, so the Vulgate is, if everyone remember, um, um, the, the, the Vulgate is Latin translation. So the Latin translation, this is what the Catholic Church used for 10 centuries and obviously into the present, but up until the, the Protestant Reformation. So in the Vulgate, they translated, of course, this is Hebrew, this is Greek. But they, here's what happened. This is how the confusion crept in. There's three Latin words 
for Bereith or Diatheke. So again, just a reminder here, this is Greek and this is Hebrew. So Latin, pactum, pactus, pactum or pactus. You could also, depending on, on, the, on the, the context, the, 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 so that means pact or covenant between parties. There's also photos. Photos is synonymous with pactum, pactus. It focuses especially on, on contract. So the focus is more on legal. It's in the legal sphere, okay? And then you have testamentum. And testamentum is universally and solely last will and testament. And then, of course, testamentum is where we get this is English. So this is where the misunderstanding happened. This is where it happened. So Jerome, late 4th century, translates the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin. In the Old Testament, he uses pactum and photos. And then in the New Testament, he uses testamentum. So everyone can see there's massive confusion there. There's incredibly massive confusion. These are not the same. And so instead of seeing one unified picture of covenant, I'm sad to say that there's that, there's that confusion that creeps in. And so they, this is how eventually they were saying that God deals one way in the Old Testament and another way in the New Testament. And this is where really Testament obviously is English, but they would they they originally said old i i don't even know the latin word for old but it was testamentum was used and so that's really what happened that's so essentially myers says the vulgate translation undermined the meaning of covenant and implied different work of god in the new testament that's the big takeaway that's the big takeaway there and it's uh sayang telega Here's now the English translations. Here are now the English translations. Okay, so we have two of them here. So now that we know it's covenant, we're trying to understand and define covenant, right? So we don't really use covenant now in our languages. We use it. It's a legal term, but not really in colloquial English or maybe Tagalog. I don't know. OED, the Oxford English Dictionary says it's a mutual agreement between two or more persons to do or refrain from doing certain acts, a compact, a contract, a bargain. Sometimes the undertaking or pledge or promise of one of the parties. Okay, so this is to make or enter into a covenant. This is so this is mutual. And so this is this is already deficient because God, if we're if we're talking about man to man, it's good. If we're talking about God to man, already our understanding and covenant, right? So the biggest example here would be marriage. Marriage would be the biggest example of a covenant agreement that's equal right so even in understanding our covenant it's deficient so we have to also define this theologically the the westminster dictionary of theological terms says a formal agreement or treaty between two parties that establishes a relationship in which obligations and mutual responsibilities may be enacted among the biblical covenants some provide only divine promises while others entail obligations so that's this is a this is a better definition that really kind of encapsulates. Okay, so we could we could tweak these. We'll tweak these later. So it's not mutual. It's you know, and so this comes into the the debates um, with within covenant theology. I'm sure one of the students brought it up last time. I don't know if he's still here. Is is is, is Mel here? We'll we'll talk about yeah, Mel's still here. We'll talk about the uh, the suzerain vassal <laughs> treaties later. Uh, because that's also helpful as well. Any questions or comments? Is this making sense so far? I know everyone's bashful. It's the first time, but don't be afraid. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Make a comment. Conclusions. <laughs> Old and New Testament. The word for, for Old and New Testament is diatheke. <laughs> so we're, we're trapped in the history of tradition. And so Old and New Testament that's the word that's used, but in actuality, it's referring to old and new covenants. Is everyone tracking there with me? So we should all be covenant theologians. <laughs> we should all believe in covenant theology. <laughs> okay, so so this is the whole debate kind of disappears. <laughs> everyone tracking there? So you know when you have your Bible. Where's my Bible? Hold on one second. So re re regrettably, regrettably, it'll say 
Old Testament, New Testament, right? You can see that there. And so, yeah, <laughs> we can summarize it as, a, as the Old Covenant, the whole Old Testament as the New Test, the, the New Covenant, okay? So here we go. Although there are some specific instances where diatheke ought to be translated testament. So I don't want to say there's never, there's at least maybe one instance in the New Testament, one or two instances. In the majority of instances, we must follow the Hebrew original meaning, i.e. covenant, 